Hello, I'm Nikia Stor, Head of R&D here at Resalt. And today I would like to do a follow-up video on the last video where we introduced our new Resalt UHF transponder. And today um, we would like to explain a little bit how we actually compared the transponders and how the measurement works. So this will be a very technical video. Um, I hope it's interesting for you. So to start with, we, as I explained in the last video, test our transponders in the lab and not on race day. This is because we don't really have a lot of transponders to test with because normally you get hand samples, just a few, and you need to decide whether the transponder is good for you or not without having thousands of transponders to test on a race. And for this, we build our own test setup here in our house. Actually, we did it in our EMI chamber. So we have a chamber which is downstairs in the basement, which actually is um, normally used for pre-compliance testing, um, for FCC regulations, things like that. And what we did is we built up a test stand, which from a top view looks like this. We have a place where we can put the transponder, and we have two antennas, which basically look like this. And they are connected to a pile of test equipment outside the chamber. What we can do with this test equipment is that we can actually simulate a RFID reader. So what we do is we generate the RF pattern that normally comes from an RFID reader. And by simulating this, we can exactly configure the reader we, the way we want it. So we, for example, can tune the output power very precisely. We can tune the frequency to whatever we want it to be. And we can configure parameters of the RFID protocol. So we can sweep through frequency, power, and different parameters and test the transponder, which is receiving the power from this transmitting antenna, and then hopefully reacting and sending power to the receiving antenna. Now on the receiver side, we have a spectrum analyzer that we use to actually capture the signal which comes back from the transponder. This again is something different to a normal RFID reader because it's much more sensitive and we can exactly specify how we want to receive the pattern coming back from the transponder. And what we measure is two things. One thing is we measure the power that the transponder is sending us. So actually this is called backscattering. Maybe you're aware of this, but we send some power to the transponder. The transponder needs to be powered itself by this power and then it reflects some power to the receiving antenna. Now this is called backscattering and what we measure is the backscatter efficiency, meaning how much of the transmitted power is actually reflected by the transponder and can be received. Obviously, a higher backscatter efficiency is better. The higher the backscatter efficiency, the more power gets reflected from the transponder and the easier it is to detect by a RFID, an RFID reader. The other thing that we measure is the sensitivity of the transponder, meaning how much power does it take to actually activate the transponder. So if you dial down the power on the sending side here, on the transmitter, and you power dial it down, 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 there will be a point where you don't receive the transponder anymore. This is because the power that is getting to the transponder is too little for the transponder to be powered, and then it won't wake up anymore, and this is the sensitivity. Obviously, again, the sensitivity of the transponder is very important, and we want the sensitivity to be as high as possible, meaning that the transponder wakes up with as low as power possible. So we are looking for transponders which have a high sensitivity, meaning lead less power to wake up, and a high backscatter efficiency, meaning we get a lot of signal back to receive 
So once the transponder has power, we make sure we can actually detect it. So some more things about this chamber, just that you, for the people who are interested in it. Actually, the chamber um, has lots of absorbing material in there. Maybe some of you ask yourself, why is this there? And um, I would like to go a little into detail. Why are we doing this in a chamber and why do we need a chamber for this? So the chamber serves for three purposes. Number one, obviously it's enclosed metal. Actually, it's in the basement here, additional to that, but the enclosed metal means that nothing that happens inside this chamber gets out of it and nothing can come into it. And first reason we use it is that we sweep our frequencies through a frequency range, which is, which is obviously not legal here in Germany. So we can't be sending on a frequency, for example, in Germany there is telecommunication, cell phone networks, there's communication for the trains and stuff like that happening on those frequencies. So we can't be sending on those frequencies. So we need to be in an enclosed chamber to test our transponders on frequencies which are normal RFID frequencies somewhere else in the world. That's for number one. Number two is looking at the absorbers. The issue with the absorbers is that in radio frequencies, if you generate a wave, it actually is a sine wave, which is basically coming out of the transmitting antenna. And this sine wave is reflected from anything metal. Okay. Now, if you look at this, if there would be something metal back here, it would be reflected and maybe look like this, what's coming back, what is reflected. And the reflected sine wave adds up with the sine wave which is going there and may cancel each other out. It may also happen that you have a spot somewhere along where it cancels each other out and somewhere else it doesn't. And this affects the whole measurement. You can't actually measure if you have any reflections going on because you're never sure if you're actually measuring what the transponder is doing or if you're measuring some kind of reflection um, uh, effect where um, you have some piece behind your transponder which is generating a what's called a standing wave um, which affects your measurement. So this is why we have the absorbers. Number three is we want to have an absolutely quiet room. You can imagine in this house here, in our building, there are F RFID readers everywhere. They're being tested in production. We have some people in our rental pool room where they test transponders and equipment. Basically, there is an, a very dense RF environment. And what we need to make sure is that when we measure something here, that we are actually really measuring our transponder under test and not something else that's happening in the room. It might even be just a cell phone sending on a frequency that we might be measuring. So it's really important to isolate this from the rest of the world. So basically, as nothing gets out, nothing can get in. So this is why we need a EMI chase test chamber. So now back to the measurement. What we do um, is that normally we do three measurements. We do a first measurement, which is in free air. This is what the transponders, all the standard transponders, were normally designed for. So the transponder has the perfect conditions to do whatever it's designed for. So free air means it is in a little cardboard, but there's not, nothing really around it. Then the next test is we put a 10 millimeter foam behind it, and then we put a piece of cheese behind it. This means that the transponder sitting on 10 millimeter foam on a piece of cheese. And this is the typical scenario if you have your bib on your t-shirt or something like that, where you have a tree hanging and there is some air between the transponder and the body. The piece of cheese is simulating the body. And actually it is a quasi standard in the industry to test this on a piece of cheese because the cheese has a very comparable combination of materials like the human body. So the third test that we do is we get rid of the 10 millimeter foam and just place the transponder directly on the cheese with just a thin layer of foam which is part of the transponder itself. So here you have a typical setup with our transponder, 1.5 millimeter of foam with our new transponder, 3 millimeter of foam with our old transponder and the piece of cheese. And as you will see in the data, this, the three different test setups vary significantly in transponder performance. And it's important to test the different transponders in these three setups 
to understand what the difference model was designed for and to understand whether it will be good in our application or not. So just to prepare you for the diagrams that I will be showing now, the diagrams have two values on one diagram. So what they look like is this. Down here, you will see a frequency which basically goes from 850 megahertz to 950 megahertz. This is the test frequency. So with our generator over here, we sweep through this frequency range to see how the transponder performs on different parts of the world. Because there is a, there is a band somewhere here, which is the A66 megahertz band, which is basically Europe and some other countries. And then there is um, a large band over here from 900 to 930 megahertz, which is um, the US. Then there are other bands like here in this part, which is Australia. And you get the picture. So basically, all the different countries have different frequencies, somewhere between 850 and 950 megahertz. And it's important that our transponders, as we can't control where they are going, um, need to be working on all the different uh, markets. And um, we need to specify this um, and do the whole measurements over this frequency range. So um, just to make things clearer, I got rid of the frequency bands again so I can draw what you will be seeing in the diagrams. So on this side here, you see the sensitivity. And uh, the sensitivity means, uh, as I explained, how much power does it take to actually wake up the transponder? So this is the minimum power needed to wake up the transponder. And it is better if the transponder needs less power. Okay? So if the transponder needs less power, it will wake up in worst case condition. If a transponder needs more power, it might be not enough to wake it up. So the further down this line, the better. So this typically over frequency might look something like, like this. Okay? So there are different things in place here with nonlinearities in the antenna, and it is actually quite difficult to tune a um, transponder to be active on such a wide frequency band. So there are some variations over frequency. So this will be the sensitivity. The other value on this side here will be the backscatter efficiency. So this is backscatter efficiency. The backscatter efficiency means if we wake up the transponder, how strong is the signal backscattered? And obviously here, the higher the efficiency, the better. So here, the further up, the better the transponder is. Again, backscatter efficiency means the transponder is working, and how strong is it reflecting the power? And the stronger it is, the easier it is to receive the signal from the transponder. So a higher backscatter efficiency is better. And this will, in all the diagrams, be in a dashed line. So this may look something like this. OK? So a typical comparison, if you take two transponders, would, at the end, maybe look something like this. OK? And maybe like this. So let's say we have a transponder A and we have a transponder B. And now the question is, which transponder is better? OK, so if you look at this, you see that transponder B has a better sensitivity, saying it needs less power to wake up. Here, it is lower. It needs less power to wake up over the whole band. So the green transponder is definitely waking up at lower powers and is therefore better. On the other side, if you look up here, this is the backscatter efficiency. The backscatter efficiency of the green line, meaning there is more power reflected, is also better over the whole frequency band. So in this very simple diagram, transponder B is definitely better than transponder A. And this is actually how we shoot out all the transponder. Last year, we went through dozens, dozens of transponders, actually, and did exactly this, and measured those 
the numbers and looked at all the different diagrams and looked at different measurements from, as I said, air, 10 millimeter on cheese and on cheese and compared the diagrams and that's how we came up with the race result transponder that we have now. So this is real measurement data from our measurements throughout the year, comparing a few of the transponders which are particularly interesting. To start with, we will start at looking at the free air measurement. Again, as I said, we have the solid lines showing the sensitivity and the dashed lines showing the backscatter efficiency. And we are comparing four different transponders here. The black transponder is our old race result transponder on three millimeter foam. The red transponder is the current SmartTrack Monza R6 with 1.5 millimeter foam. And the blue and green transponders are the new race result transponder. We have two transponders here because one is an early prototype and one is out of the current production run. And here you can see how repeatable the measurement and how repeatable the transponder manufacturing actually is because obviously if it's the same transponder you would expect the same values. So we will always have the black transponder, this is our old race result transponder 3mm foam, the red transponder being a Monza R6 standard smart track dog bone and the blue and the green which are the new race result transponders. You can obviously see that in free air the differences aren't that great, especially in the European section here over here. You see that um, the Monza R6 is actually a little bit better than our um, uh, standard race result transponders and the old transponder. Um, and in the American market over here you see that the race result transponder outperforms the others, the Monza R6 and the old. Um, now, the thing is that in free air it's never really an issue because in free air all UHF systems work pretty decently. So the free air measurement just gives you a rough indication of how good a transponder is overall and you can already see that those transponders are on par I would say. Um, also if you look at the backscatter efficiencies the differences are small and um, it is not really a good test and that's um, actually what happens a lot of times that people believe that if they hold a transponder in front of an antenna and they go 10 meters away and they think okay this thing works great and um, they actually make a huge mistake because in free air it is very very, very easy for the transponder to operate. So the free air measurement doesn't really say a lot. So now if we go on the, onto the 10 millimeter on cheese measurement, things change a little bit. What you can already see here is that the differences have gotten a little bit bigger and um, that the blue and green lights, which are the new rice cell transponders, already outperform the other ones significantly in the American frequency range. Now, one thing which is important is here, you can, could argue that the Monza R6 is the same level as um, our new rice cell transponder, and that's true. The thing is that only about 20% of our market happens over here, and 80% happens in this frequency range. All the American countries, actually also Asia, Australia, happen over here. And currently there's a development going on where even the EU will switch from here to here. So this band is more important for us than this band. And in general, it is always a good thing if on 80% on our market, the, the, our transponders outperforms the rest. You can see there is basically a difference here and on this side between our old transponder and the Monza R6 and the Monza R6 and our new transponder, which is basically in the middle. So you could argue that the Monza R6 is double as good as the um, our old transponder and then our new transponder is again double as good. On the backscatter efficiency you still don't see huge differences. Um, actually they are so close together it's really hard to tell them apart and you see that even the measurement uncertainties between the blue and the green over here um, are greater than the variances between those transponders. So obviously in this test we don't see a lot of backscatter efficiency uh, um, changes because those transponders are all of them are pretty good already. 
I mean, this is also for testing all kinds of transponders that we got from all ends of the world. And there are transponders which are much worse. So I'm already showing you transponders here, which all are pretty decent. I mean, this is the transponder we've been using so far. This is the transponder that many people are using out there. And this is our new transponder. So obviously, all of them have to be pretty good. OK, now let's move to the last measurement. This is the on cheese. So basically, what we see here is a measurement with 1.5 millimeter foam between the Monza R6 and our new transponder between the transponder and the cheese, and three millimeter um, between the old race result transponder on cheese. So you can see again that the green and the blue line outperform the Monza R6 and the old. A resident transponder. And here you see a huge difference in backscatter efficiency. This is the important thing here to, to look at. The dashed line, the red dashed line, is the backscatter efficiency of the Monza R6 on cheese, which is significantly worse than our current transponder and our old transponder. I mean, obviously, the comparison between our old and our current transponder is not really fair here, because the old transponder has 3 millimeter foam in this uh, scenario. And um, it wakes up at much higher power. So it's easier for the old transponder to have a good backscatter efficiency. So to explain that again, at, a, at this power level here, the old transponder doesn't even wake up. So you can't measure its efficiency there. So it is a little bit unfair to compare it like that. But still, um, what can clearly be seen here is that the Monza R6 has a significantly worse um, backscatter efficiency. And this is why we believe that we have the best performing transponder out there right now, because the 1.5 millimeter on cheese is the worst case scenario. That's when things get wet, people get sweaty, it rains, the transponder starts to stick to the human body. This is exactly this case. And this is where it's really difficult to pick up the transponders and where we still want to generate our above 99.8% detection rate. And this is the way we do it. So I hope you like this uh, new uh, RF text deep dive video. Obviously, if you made it to the end, you are interested in this technical stuff. And I know some of you like this. Um, I know some of you may be bored. Um, but to be honest, you know, this is what really makes fun to me. So I really like to explain it. And I hope I can do more videos like this. And see you next time.